What's up guys, Helen here. At Wisecrack, there's nothing we like more than having our minds bent by movies. Whether we're wrapping our brains around multiple layers of dreamland faux reality, witnessing a ballerina totally losing her shit, or watching a dude explore the intricacies of indoor plumbing, we tend to absolutely love it when movies turn our brains into jello. And arguably, few films are quite as mind-bendy as Martin Scorsese's 2010 thriller, Shutter Island. The film has more twists and turns than a Chuck E. Cheese playground slide, but we've always found the reveal at the end to be more than vaguely predictable. In the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of movies featured a twist revealing our protagonist's warped perspective. Fight Club, A Beautiful Mind, The Machinist, Identity, etc. Coming out in 2010, it seemed like Shutter Island was a little late to the party, leaving us at Wisecrack wondering, is that all there is to it? Is this movie as smart as you'd expect from one of America's most celebrated filmmakers? Is there something deeper going on? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on Shutter Island. Deep or dumb? Oh, and for the second time, spoilers ahead. Alright guys, let's do a little recap. Shutter Island places us in a creepy mental institution made creepier by its convenient isolation from society vis-a-vis -a, -vis a ton of water. Leo plays ugly tie-wearing Teddy, a US Marshal investigating the disappearance of Rachel Solando, one of the island's dangerous criminal inmates whose favorite hobbies include drowning her children and then blacking out. Soon, we meet the requisite sketchy psychiatrist, including one who's definitely not so curious. When head shrink Dr. Colley proves shady and doesn't cooperate with the investigation, things seem increasingly more sinister. All the while, Teddy has a ton of trippy flashbacks, reliving the various traumas of his life, ranging from liberating the Dachau concentration camp to losing his wife to a fire. Also, turns out that the guy who started said fire, Andrew Latus, is at this mental institution, and Teddy wants to track him down. Do you know a patient named Andrew Latus? This whole mission culminates in him discovering the real Rachel Solando hanging out by an international rat convention, claiming to be a psychiatrist who discovered that the doctors are using lobotomies and experiments as part of a top-secret government program to develop mind control techniques. Yikes! Only, things are about to get wilder. We find out that Teddy is actually Andrew, who became psychotic after killing his wife because she killed their three children. On top of that, his entire investigation was actually just an elaborate LARPing experiment conducted by the asylum to help rid Teddy, I mean, Andrew, um, I'm just gonna call him Teddy, okay? Of his illusions as a slightly demented form of roleplay therapy while presumably also giving this doctor and patient amateur acting troupe a chance to show off their chops. Oh, also, unless Leo acknowledges the truth about his past and accepts the totality of his identity, he's gonna be lobotomized. He's like, hard pass, and heads up to the creepy lighthouse to go get his brain jiggled by chopsticks. The end. Even if you've seen Shutter Island, that synopsis might read like your most ADHD friend trying to get through a campfire story. It's helpful here to contextualize this movie as an homage to high- and lowbrow film noir traditions. Film noir was the catch-all phrase for this special brand of film that particularly flourished post-World War II. It featured dark shadows, unreliable narrators, weird angled shots, and, perhaps most iconically, plots that involve plenty of unexpected twists and dramatic reveals, but maybe aren't 100% airtight. All of the above could just as easily describe Shutter Island. Indeed, this film is almost pulpy in the way it purely revels in every noir trope. From the creepy cemetery to the fantastical dream sequences to the narrator with the slowly revealed dark past, especially one rooted in World War II, with mental asylums, a looming tall building, in this case a lighthouse, creepy staircases, casual semi-Nazis, and more, the film almost reads like a grab bag of noir traditions. That Scorsese was deliberately evoking noir is important in parsing the film. That's because, in general, noir films are less concerned with narrative coherence than they are with mood, atmosphere, and conveying the psychological condition, usually suffering, of their protagonist. We're gonna treat Shutter Island like a noir and say up front, the narrative plot has a lot of turns and arguably doesn't add up. But that's almost literally irrelevant. What's more interesting is whether the film compellingly depicts Teddy's psychological condition and, in the process, reveals anything about us slash humanity at large. So, with that caveat, let's dive in. At its core, Shutter Island is about a man who refuses to acknowledge large swaths of his inner self, and so he creates an alternate reality. Scholar Stella Bruzzi actually compares it to Inception when she writes that interiority, that means inner character slash subjectivity, in both Inception and Shutter Island is directly threatening to the protagonist's mental and physical stability. The lack of clarity between layers of consciousness is a key narrative element. Indeed, Teddy's closed himself off from the traumas of his past, 
and can only reckon with those memories by dreaming them or projecting them onto other people's lives, hence conjuring Rachel Solando and Latus. He's living in a fantasy world lurking with sinister, presumably imagined, threats. His disconnection with his own identity is almost immediately established in one of the first shots, when we see Teddy examining his own face in a shaky mirror. He's just puked his guts out, suggesting an inner discordance and inability to orient himself. The mirror perhaps indicates the duplicity inherent to his character. As scholar Annette Wernblad puts it, one might argue that the entire journey takes place inside the mind, on the other side of the mirror. From there, Scorsese uses every tool in his cinematic toolbox to convey this warped reality. Most literally, the film employs an estimated 650 special effects, including blue screen mats, digital painting, 3D computer effects, and even digital miniatures. While plenty of movies use a crap ton of special effects, they're generally employed to achieve visual believability. Here, all of the special effects work to create a slightly artificial reality. This is fitting for a movie in which 90% of the action takes place inside a giant performative charade undertaken by the world's most dramatically talented drinks. It's even more fitting for a narrative viewed entirely through the eyes of a man literally living in a fantasy world. Examples of this artificiality include the rear projection-inspired shots of the ocean and sky behind the boat when the men arrive at Shutter Island, the artificial lusciousness of this gazebo setting, and the almost absurdly thick, dreamlike layer of fog in the movie's opening shot. At the same time, the perspective is purposefully disjointed, with instances of almost deliberately sloppy editing. Like in the boat sequence when Teddy's partner's mouth is out of sync with his words until it cuts to a reverse shot, at which point it's suddenly in sync. How long you been with the Martians? Four years. So you know how small it is? Sure. What about you? You got a girl? A similar effect is achieved in a flashback when Teddy's wife starts talking before we see her mouth move, followed by another jarring cut. Remember when we stayed in the cabin in the summer, Teddy? We were so happy. She's here. You can't leave. Here, the contrasting use of jarring angles in succession, along with inaccurate sound syncing, serves to disorient us and rattle our perspective, an imitation of Teddy's rattled psyche. In another instance, when the men are being introduced to the buildings on the island, there's a whip pan which sloppily hides an editing cut, as if Teddy hesitates for a moment in keeping up the charade while staring at familiar buildings. All of these interruptions are entirely intentional, meant to jolt us just as Teddy's psyche is being jolted with memories. The sound design also reflects Teddy's heightened sense of fear and paranoia. Sometimes the sound mix is too loud as with the initial over-the-top ship noises that don't coincide with the actual waves, creating a sense of hyper-reality fitting for a character with no grasp on the truth. Other times the sound is unnaturally quiet, as when they're entering Ward C and we see a lot more rain than we can hear. Throughout, during moments of high tension, sounds and music are ramped up beyond mere dramatics, from the extreme introduction to the island, to the thunderstorm that booms after Teddy gets a disturbing note from one of the patients. Other visual elements help situate us in Teddy's mind. As the film's director of photography, Robert Richardson, put it, the lighting, color, and texture all contribute to the blurring of reality and hallucination, raising the question of what is subjective versus objective. Colors in particular play an important role from the very beginning. Teddy's false reality on Shutter Island is desaturated and vaguely dismal. These segments are far less vivid than his fantasies and dreams, which take place in hyper-saturated hues inspired by 1950s-era Kodachrome film. That they feel hyper-real suggests that Teddy's dream world is more palpable to him than the world around him, and helps us understand just how vivid his illusions really are. While much of the present-day scenes are filled with gloomy grays and blues, it doesn't stay this way the entire movie. The colors become increasingly brighter, almost blinding, in moments when Teddy comes close to discovering the truth or has an encounter that jiggles his memory, crescendoing in this scene, which is filled with pools of light, perhaps literally representing the way the truth will shine a light on Teddy's delusions. In fact, 
Teddy even walks right into the light as his doctor delivers the final blow of reality, showing him photos of his dead children. And he falls into a halo of brightness and collapses after remembering these painful experiences. In the final scene, the grounds of the asylum are nearly as saturated as his fantasies, suggesting that he is fully, or at least more so, present in reality. Scorsese doesn't only rely on the strength of his own movie to convey this theme. See, Scorsese is a grade A film nerd, and that nerdiness is on full display in Shutter Island. The film is littered with references to other movies, especially film noirs, but also other classics about madness and psychosis like Suspiria and Shock Corridor. His clearest influence, though, is Alfred Hitchcock, who popularized the modern use of the psychological subjectivity via an unreliable narrator trope. Scorsese even had his crew watch Hitchcock's The Wrong Man in preparation for shooting Shutter Island. As the eagle-eyed Guardian writer Andrew Pulver notes, these homages range from a showerhead spouting water like in Psycho, to climbing a narrow stairway like in Vertigo, to hanging off of a cliff like Cary Grant in North by Northwest, to this creative shot of a gun like in Spellbound, to this tree flying through a wall like in Marnie. What's more, the use of blue screen matte paintings is reminiscent of the technology Hitchcock would use when situating his characters in unfilmable backgrounds. As the film's special effects supervisor Rob Legato put it, there's a fine line between making it mostly look correct, but not all correct, so it has a Hitchcock quality to it. Another famous director, Stanley Kubrick, gets a shout out too. The looming tracking shots that put us directly in Teddy's physical movements deliberately evoke a similar technique that Kubrick innovatively employed in The Shining as a means of more accurately conveying subjectivity through cinematography. Similarly, the choice to use music by one of Kubrick's favorite composers, Giorgi Ligeti, also evokes the master's work. We could spend ages parsing the film for every reference, but we think you get the point. Scorsese is infusing his film with all the major cinematic trappings of subjectivity and unreliable narration to put us directly in Teddy's shoes. So Scorsese is certainly using a lot of cool techniques to make the movie more effective, but does that mean there's anything deep there? Well, we think so, and yep, we're going meta. All of these devices are actually reinforcing a major theme of the film, that we need to empathize with people experiencing mental illness rather than writing them off as crazy or untreatable. This is Dr. Colley's position to begin with, that you should treat patients like human beings and see them as capable of growth and improvement, even if they've committed violent crimes. Just as Kingsley sees them as sympathetic, saying, My job to treat my patients, not their victims. I'm not here to judge. We too learn to view them as sympathetic by seeing the world through an actual patient's perspective. At the beginning, these patients are regarded by the camera as freaks and spectacles, to be viewed from afar and nervously ignored. By the end, we've engaged with many of them as human beings. And most importantly, we've been thrust into Teddy's subjectivity. We've seen his struggle firsthand, thereby making us recognize his unmistakable humanity. As a result, we know that, despite the whole killing his wife thing, Teddy's a pretty caring dude with some genuinely good qualities. If we had met Teddy as an inmate early on, we would have regarded him as merely insane, not unlike Teddy does when he first surveys the island's patients. The film seems to rather blatantly articulate its thesis statement via this written plaque at the beginning of the film, which reads, Remember us, for we too have lived, loved, and laughed. We're forced by nature of the cinematic experience to sympathize with people whom society typically ignores or overlooks. Cinema is one of the only art forms that can so palpably immerse us in someone else's experience. And we think that makes it a pretty powerful thing, and Shutter Island a pretty powerful film. But all of this is in the service of the central question being posed by the film. Can you rehabilitate evil, and should you even try? Throughout the film, Teddy makes his position very clear. Evil is black and white to him. He doesn't see the inmates at Shutter Island as worthy of reformation because they've committed violent crimes. These are all violent defenders, right? I mean, they've hurt people, murdered them in some cases. In almost all cases, yes. And personally, Dr. I'd have to say, screw their sense of calm. He also refuses to give a dying Nazi a gun so he can end the pain. And he's one of the first soldiers to start shooting at the Nazis after the Allies have raided the camp. In contrast, Dr. Colley makes clear his opposing view, that no person is beyond redemption or rehabilitation. These two opposing views are complicated when we learn that Teddy is in fact an inmate whom Colley is currently attempting to rehabilitate. The film addresses this question most compellingly, though, through its use of flashbacks to memories that Teddy can't process without dissociating from. What the film seems to argue is that what we consider evil 
is really just the sum result of trauma mixed with mental instability. We can recognize that Teddy isn't evil, and in doing so, have to question whether anybody really is. Except, hold the phone, what about Nazis? Well, what makes this film so interesting is that it isn't so one-sided on the issue of evil. It leaves us to decide for ourselves. Teddy doesn't reconcile his trauma and suddenly believe that people can be rehabilitated. Quite the opposite. Instead, it seems like he chooses to be taken to the lighthouse to be lobotomized. Which would be worse? To live as a monster? Or to die as a good man? Here, he seems to be explaining his two choices. Live with the knowledge of what he's done, or metaphorically die vis-a-vis -a, -vis a stick in his brain while still under the illusion that he is a good guy. Here, we see Teddy appearing to affirm his belief stated throughout the movie, that the violently criminal cannot be reformed, that he is not capable of change or growing past his mistakes. Upon close analysis, it becomes pretty clear that every cinematic element, from lighting to coloring to production design to cinematography to music cues, was carefully chosen in order to serve the higher themes at work, with those being the subjectivity of film, the nature of insanity, the redemptive potential of the criminal, and the very nature of evil. So we're gonna have to call this film deep, and at least deeper than the deep end of your community swimming pool. But what do you guys think? Is Shutter Island a Scorsese and masterpiece? Or did dude get a little too caught up in faking hurricanes and generally failed to impress with his big twist ending? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks to our dope patrons for supporting the channel and our podcasts. Remember to hit that subscribe button, and as always, peace.